Welcome everybody to our 4th of July edition of the Safely Stream Podcast. I am Josh Blazer from Game Wisdom, and joining me as always, my co-host from Nexus Games, Sharky. How are you doing this 4th of July? I'm doing uh, alright, uh, and I won't be from Nexus Games for very much longer since we're renaming the company, and happy 4th to everybody. Mm-hmm. It's ironic that I got that right when it appeared on video, even though I typed it like 30 seconds ago. <laughs> right now it is G raining outside, so we'll see if it keeps lasting in terms of whether or not we have any 4th of July celebrations around here. <laughs> you mean G plus raining? Mm hmm. SD G raining. <laughs> G generation yep. raining. <laughs> <laughs> But, as I said, we are streaming this on July 4th, so we're not expecting a lot of chat. And our topic this week will be kind of on the smaller side. And as always, if you are interested in pitching a topic or want to hang out with us, you can leave comments or join our respective discords. Yep, we're always welcoming to people on our discord, and there's lots of cool things to do on our discords. Mm Mm-hmm. So one, you know, and we have two separate discords that also needs to be, you know, recognized as well as two separate chats. So feel free to chat in both of them. Feel free to join both of our discords. And I think we should get into it. Mm -hmm. So our topic this week is we're going to be discussing kind of bad game design or bad gameplay trends that are still going on in some way, shape or form whether it's in the AAA space, indie, or in between the two. And this is one of those topics that it can be very hard to talk about because, you know, rating or kind of judging gameplay or game design on its own, it can lead to people, you know, saying, oh, you just hate this game or you hate so-and-so, you know, you're just, you know, hating on what's popular. But there are elements that we have seen all out of favor, especially as the market has grown and evolved, particularly over the like the last 10 years. Yeah. So I have one question for you, Josh. Mm-hmm. What's in between Indie and Triple A? Is that Andy? <laughs> Double A. Is that single A? <laughs> Inda? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, there's definitely different ways we can approach this, and I guess uh, I'll start with talking about elements that are purposely there to waste somebody's time. Whether it is, you know, extreme Kaizo level of difficulty. Now, that's not to say that Kaizo games are inherently bad. Again, the Kaizo market has certainly exploded over kind of like the last five, six years with the rise of speedrunning, Mario Maker, and so on. But again, keep in mind that Kaizo games are free. You're not spending $60 on a Kaizo game. And yet, we still see developers who are kind of pushing to make their games either as hard to learn as possible or as hard to play as possible. But should we be seeing uh, $60 Kaizo games? Because, I mean, Kaizo games are basically all about masochism. And, uh, Hmm. I mean, shouldn't they be like five or six hundred dollars at that point? You know, because, you know, you're you're giving the masochistic experience to their wallet as well as in the game, you know, at that rate, you know? (laughs) But, like, wasting somebody's time, I think, is like one of the biggest, I think, design sins that can still happen in today's market. And joking aside, consumers these days are being flooded with games. Again, we've said this time and time again. And you really don't want to waste somebody's time. You know, the when are we getting to the fireworks uh, factory from The Simpsons kind of talk. And I feel like developers are still, or there's still that idea that, you know, length equals quality. And in many cases, it does not. Yeah, it, it, it does not at all. Length has zero to do with quality. Actually, I won't say that. <coughs> Length almost has something mm-hmm. to do with anti-quality. They're not exactly parallel, but they do run a lot of, par- a lot of things in common. Mm-hmm. Because typically, 
the longer the game is, either the developer put in a crap ton of work or they they didn't and uh the game is inferior because of it. So mm-hmm. a longer game without a lot more work is typically bad. You know, not not always because I mean you have the the shorter games that you can play forever kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, with long play times. But I mean I that's both a longer game and a shorter game at the same time. So I mean that's that's sort of a safe way stream one. So like you know, you you know, we, we give Safeway Stream stuff to pass, but mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, when when it comes to um, just a straight up longer game, you need content to fill it out, and if you're not filling it out with content, and you're stalling the player based off a of difficulty, based off of whatever you know, based off a of filler content, whatever it is, it's not good. No, it is not. And I, it's important to clarify uh, what Shark said about having short games that can be long. <coughs> and my voice is already dying on this 4th of July, so that's good. <laughs> but Maybe you just need to shoot some firecrackers in, mm-hmm. in your throat. There you go. Light up, light up your throat. <laughs> but when we talk about games that have very short experiences that can be played long, what we mean by that is a title that has a very streamlined, very short-term core gameplay loop, but it's inherently designed to be replayed again and again and again. So roguelikes would be a really good example of this. Titles that kind of really lean into long-term progression, such as mobile games, would also be example. Or even, you know, deck builders, games that the core gameplay could be five to 30 minutes long, but you can repeat that five to 30 minutes uh, gameplay loop again and again, and it still is entertaining. Multi- like most multiplayer games also fall into that line, unless we're talking about, you know, playing Civilization multiplayer. Yeah, most life services also fall into that category. Mm-hmm. Yep. But when we talk about when there's a problem, is that when a game demands a lot of time to be spent playing it. So that instead of a core game play where you can sit down and get 20 to 30 minutes of enjoyment, it turns into you need to play this game for at minimum 20 to 30 hours before you start to see, you know, anything good in it. Yeah, it's it is an issue. You you don't want to you know, just put a whole bunch of filler stuff before the game gets good. Mm-hmm. You also don't want to put a bunch of filler stuff after the <laughs> game gets good. And by mm-hmm. filler stuff, wow, the camera changed colors when you coughed. <laughs> the, uh, you don't want, and by filler stuff, that could mean anything. That could mean just overly reusing content. That could be, I'm going to make this really, really hard jump that's going to take 500 attempts to do it for no reason other than just to slow the players down. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to, uh, let me think of another example. Um, I'm going to make them repeat the same fun thing five billion times till it's, it was no longer fun 20,000 times ago, but uh, you're going to have to still do it many, many times over again because I don't have anything else to put here, you know? Mm hmm. And, when we the other part about this <coughs> excuse me is when a game pads out the onboarding or learning process there's this tendency among strategy games and strategy game designers that the game is designed that you're learning through failure as in your first like 2 to 3 times you're going to play it this campaign you're going to lose and the point is that you're going to learn through failing eventually what not to do. Are but, you no onboarding? Yep. Such as with the Gundam game, with Old World, with just felt like any very systems heavy kind of design where it's where a developer kind of fails on building a proper tutorial. And the problem is twofold with this. 
it, it kind of is that you're not going to learn how to play the game through playing the game. It's kind of like you're going to learn through failure, and that's the only way you're even going to have any chance of winning. And the problem with this is that, one, it pads out the experience. <laughs> Two, it is greatly overestimating how much somebody's going to commit to playing your game. And three, it is just, you're kind of just applying a band-aid fix to your whole game's issues of UI and UX. Yeah. And the the uh issue what we run into with that kind of thing is you're you're overusing stuff you know and uh you're it would be much better to have a game that is i don't know what four hours long and wows you every mm -hmm. single minute mm -hmm. rather than something that's 40 hours long that wows you once every 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. But that wow means far less because it was 40 minutes apart because I was bored for 40 minutes to get to that wow kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying you need a wow moment every minute kind of thing, but a wow moment every minute is better than one every 10 minutes, which is better than one every... 40 minutes, which is better than one every hour, which is better than one every day kind of thing. When you're talking about days for WoW moments, that is that is very bad. When you're talking about hours for WoW moments, no, that that's bad. You, you, what would you say would be the acceptable um, longest time for a WoW moment? What, about an hour? Yeah, Maybe I'm less than an hour? I feel maybe no more than 30 minutes. Like, in 30 minutes' time, you know, something should be happening. Like, anything that makes you want to keep playing the game. It goes back to the ever-popular civilization, just one more turn kind of feel to it. But yeah, as Allura says, it, I think it depends on the game. Like, if we're playing a platformer, you know, every, I would say like two to five minutes... Something should be like, oh my god, what what just happened, kind of thing. Yeah. Well when when but that that also goes to say that you shouldn't have to wait for thirty minutes for your first wow factor. Mm -hmm. You should be getting wow factors, several of them in the first fifteen minutes, but after that point, every thirty minutes hour might be acceptable, kind of thing. Yeah. But if you can make the game shorter kind of thing and uh you know still still needs to be long enough to you know get well enough outside of Steam's refund policy but if you make the game shorter more dense kind of thing and and densing down those wows so they're closer together then then you get you know a better effect of your game and you're you know you're going to build more fans, you're going to have less refunds, you're going to have more people, more word of mouth spreading about your game, and you're going to um, have higher completion rates of your game. Mm -hmm. And I think to Allure's other comment about, yeah, like start under power and having to grind. Like I've used that term like dead time. When nothing is really going on, you're just kind of going through the motions of playing a game. And we see this in a lot of kind of like long form mobile games or puzzle games where here's 70 levels. And then once you do those 70 levels, then we're going to lock something amazing. And then we're not going to lock something else amazing for another 50 or more levels. If you remember Grindstone, which again, having grind in the title could have, should have been an indication there that... Yes, it's a it's great to do something fun on your first level, but then you're doing the same thing but a little bit harder for the next thirty levels. Like you need to like this is something that we talk about or we see in a lot of mobile games and when we start analyzing design is about finding as Shark said, find those wow moments. Finding 
those, you know, the carrot on the stick. And you have to design your game to motivate somebody to keep playing it. And Mm -hmm. it not only does it depend on the genre, but also depends on the person playing it themselves. We spoke about psychology a lot as well, like when we when I spoke with Ramin, that there has to be something that gets those dopamine levels up when somebody's playing a game. And most people aren't going to sit around and wait for you to f- get to the good stuff. And again, the good stuff could be anything from finding a shiny piece of weapon, beating a level, getting double jump, and a Metroidvania could even apply here. Yeah. And and addressing what El Gordo said, El Gordo slash Oscar said in uh, my chat, he said, uh, if if we consider refunds, you have to play in the hours to be in the first two hours, but mm-hmm. be careful uh, you do not uh, have all there and front load the game. Well, sadly, you do want to front load your games. You know, but you don't want it all front loaded mm-hmm. unless you only have a front side of your game. You know, <laughs> you do want to, something to carry people through, but you really need to to front load it to get the hooks in people. You've got to hook the players to get them to play farther, because if you don't have enough stuff front loaded to hook them, then they are not going to experience the rest of the content in your game. So there, there's no point in having the rest of the content. So you need to have enough front-loaded that you hook the player to continue on and, and get through more of the content of the game. Because the last thing you want to do is make 500 hours of content and have people only play the first, like, two minutes and refund, you know? Yeah. Because and- at that point, you only have two minutes worth of content, and you just wasted a lot of time on the other... Mm-hmm. You know, time, and you want to really get enough things in the front that it gets them to go farther. And what I would do is really, really condense that five hour, you know, 500 hour game down to probably like a 40 hour game or maybe even smaller than that and condense all those wow moments kind of thing and make sure there's enough that are front loaded enough that will keep you going all the way through the end and something mm-hmm. really big at the end if not a couple of big things at the end you know they don't you don't need necessarily more wow moments you just need wow moments that are more com- climatic kind of thing and uh really you know sell it kind of thing at the end but you don't want to ride on that you want to ha- still have stuff at the beginning because if you don't have stuff if you don't have stuff at the front, then nobody's going to make it to the back or the middle, yeah. for that matter. But you don't want to. You need to front load it enough that they that people are committed enough to get to the middle, and then you need to have the middle not be bald and have it have enough to carry people to the end, where you leave people with a good climax at the end, and people enjoy your game at the end and are big fans. So it's mm-hmm. it's if you have too much time between those wow moments, you're going to lose players. And if you don't have enough front loaded wow moments mm-hmm. at the beginning, you're not going to have any players that get very far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, <it's> coming. <laughs> yeah. And this is also the importance of onboarding, that if people aren't getting invested in your game within the first, like, 15 minutes of playing, they're not going to stick around. And that was an issue that I think uh, SD Gundam ran into, that it's an amazing game, but it's an amazing game that requires a lot of what a lot of people call gamer tax. That the game is not giving you a reason to play it. It kind of requires you to find that reason to play it. But... The problem with that mentality, and it's the same thing we see in a lot of strategy and very complicated games, is that it only works for the most hardest of hardcore portion of your fan base. For people who are new or casual players just wanting to jump in and see what it's all about, you can't say, oh, you know, the game opens up once you've spent 100 hours playing it. Because a lot of people 
don't want to, you know, start at negative 100 hours in order to play a video game. Yeah, I would say that Gundam did not, uh, and with onboarding, that Gundam isn't, you know, where would you say that it was not giving the players, you know, something to 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 have kind of mm-hmm. thing? I mean, it definitely was giving it to them. They were giving it to them all at once, mm-hmm. but they were not telling anybody how to use any of it, how any of it operates. No so, priorities. You know, if, if, you're, if you're given a whole bunch of cool stuff, and you have no idea what the cool stuff is. I mean, like, if if I give you a cool piece of technology and it looked really, really cool and, you know, sci-fi, and you had no idea where the on button was, if there was an on button, or what the thing even did, or how it did it, or how to use it kind of thing, and you just fool with it, you know, for, like, so many minutes... You're going to get tired and put it down, you know. And if if uh, if you don't onboard people and tell people where the power button is, how things work, and what this thing actually does, people are going to get give up on trying to get it to work because I mean it could be the coolest thing in the world, but if they're not willing to put in the time to to figure out how to operate it, you know, they're going to leave. And yep. uh, that's the issue when you don't onboard properly, even when you have all this wow factors. And mm-hmm. and that is that is the the Gundam games, uh, you know, that we played the other day, the biggest, you know, downfalling yeah. of that game. You know, yeah. And I want to go back to some of that shark said a minute ago about kind of. You know, carrying people from the early game to the mid game and then to the mid game to the late game. Because we see this when we check, like, the achievement completion rates of a lot of games, that you'll typically find kind of a major drop first relatively early in the game, probably within the first hour. And then you'll find kind of another drop, usually when the game kind of enters into whatever its groove is going to be. So it's that point where you've unlocked the majority of the upgrades. You're kind of at that point where the core gameplay loop is solidified. And your goal as a developer is, again, that you want to keep as many people who play your game invested in it for as long as possible. And as a weird coincidence, again, this is why we see a lot of success in the mobile market and the games-as-a-service scene. Because these games are designed to be as engaging as possible. Again, it's something that when uh, Rami and I did our talk about free-to-play and and pay-to-win elements, that there's a reason why these games are designed in that very same formula. Because it's a formula that carries somebody inherently from beginning to middle, and then from middle to end. And you see in every gotcha game, every kind of game that's designed around, we want to get somebody to where the money making is, or the money making for us. So we want to make it as streamlined and as easy to play as possible. The whole idea that when you do quests in a mobile game, you're by inherently doing those quests, you're going to level up to the cap and then get to you know the arena or the PvP. That's not done on accident. That's done explicitly to get somebody to the part that they want you to spend money on. Mm-hmm. And you know, games have different aspects of where they 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 uh, make money, but you definitely. Um... You know, a lot of the live service games, they make the money by keeping you there, mm-hmm. which is a reason why a lot of them make a point of never letting you go. You know, you've got to be on yep. here at every day to get your login mm-hmm. bonus. You've got to be here five minutes after that to get your next login bonus. You've got to be here 15 minutes after that to get your next one. you got to be here 30 minutes after that to get your next one. you got to be here an hour after that to be- get your next one. you got to be here five hours after that to get your next one. And, you know, if you're not here for all that, then uh, 
you you get screwed. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then they do you know like oh you got to be here at this time to fight this boss. You got to be here at this time to fight this. You got to be here at this time to do this. And if you're not there, you're screwed. And they're they're locking you into like these times, trying to you know they're they're manipulating you to be there basically at all times at every you know high moment which is when you're you're when they get you committed to be there at all those times they get you committed to spend money mhm mm because you're already investing all this time so why not put more money into it because time is money yep and to Amir's comment about repetitive gameplay mechanics without any scope or scope or creativity. Yep, and this is again why a lot of these games, once that initial lure runs out, people tend to just, you know, bail and abandon ship. Uh, the topic is kind of talking about bad or poorly, uh, poor game design elements that we're still seeing developers use today. So things that kind of repel consumers, that developers are still making a mistake on. The problem that uh, when Armin and I spoke about with mobile design is that the goal of any mobile game is you need to keep somebody playing for at least two weeks. Because as Shark said, that's when the sunk cost fallacy comes into play. You know, I've already spent two weeks on this game, I'm going to play for another week. Oh, I've played this game for two months, why not give them, you know, $10? And it just builds mm -hmm. from there. But I've if already you... given them $10, why not just give them $20? Yeah. I've already given them $20, why don't I just give them 100 I've already given them $100, why not just give them 1000 I've yeah. already given them 1000 why don't I just give them my entire bank account? Mm -hmm. And then give them your house. And then give them your firstborn uh, child. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the problem with all of this is that it all hinges on you keeping them invested to begin with. And a lot of developers fail when it comes to that initial investment. Like, we have played very amazing games from indie devs over the last few years here, but a lot of them are just very poor at that first impressions. And like uh, Vision Software said, like, that is a game that it has a really great concept to it, but there are a lot of things right out of the gates, or right out of the gate, that is going to repel consumers. You know, how the game starts, how it looks, how you start learning these titles. And each one of those issues chips away at your fan base. Yeah, the game doesn't really reveal its depth for, what, until you die or something? Yeah, like at least and, a good like 30, 40 minutes. And and during that time you're well during the whole time, but you're you're exposed to art that's not bad, but not bad art in a game is bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, I mean my last title was had not bad art, but it you know, in terms of Steam and the current market, it was it was freaking horrible art, you know. Yeah. And um, you can't can't have that. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, that game that I showed on stream a few months ago, Galactic Mining Core. It's a game that I keep coming back to and playing. It's a very short gameplay loop, but what they do is that everything is kind of, you know, revolves around it. So if I do X, it makes my ship better. If I do Y, it lets me do more with that. And again, it's something that we've said before, that the best gameplay loops are those that are very short, but they're inherently enjoyable, and they can be replayed again and again. Like, you may not think of this in, like, in terms of a Mario game or Doom, but that's how it works. You know, what do you do in Mario in the course of 40 seconds? You run and you jump. But that running and jumping, it's very fulfilling to do, it's very enjoyable. So you can mm -hmm. keep playing it for each and every stage. With Doom and Doom Eternal and Doom 2016, the core gameplay loop of Doom is two to five minutes long at most. But, you know, those two to five minutes are going to get your heart pumping and racing 
and you're going to do it again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And you really have to, um, there's enough stuff to do within the first part of the game. You know, you know, you have to hook the player some way. If, if there's not enough stuff to do, then maybe there's story that hooks you. Mm -hmm. If there's not story, maybe there's um, uh, cool mechanics kind of thing. There's not very many of them, uh, you know, not very much stuff to do, but the stuff that's there is really impactful kind of thing. And, you know, you could be that, you know, I mean, streamlined tutorial slash onboarding is not not going to do it, but what it will do is it'll prevent stuff from going bad because mm -hmm. if you don't have good onboarding, it's going to ruin it kind of thing. But if you have good onboarding, nobody's going to notice, but you want nobody to notice rather than somebody to notice something bad about your game. So, you know, <laughs> and... so that's that's definitely part of the formula but doing that alone will not do it for you you have to have more mm -hmm. and that more is again going to be dependent on what your game is what you're trying to do with the design and there is no one size fits all approach to it And every game is different. Every game has its advantages and disadvantages, but you need to have enough stuff front-loaded at the beginning of the game to get people to leave the beginning of the game and continue forward. Because if you don't have enough stuff front-loaded, sadly, people won't go farther. But like we said before, you, you need stuff after the front load to keep people going. It's... If you were to make it like a, I don't know, like a heat map or something, or like mm -hmm. a heat chart, you'd want the beginning of the game to be really, really freaking hot. And then, like, you'd want the middle of the game to be a steady, well, not necessarily a steady temperature, but have, you know, like, keep moments with, with you know, cool moments in between kind of thing and just have it like swing like like a spider-man sp swing on his web you know you create the art between the two hot moments kind of thing and but you don't want to create the hot moments so far apart that spider-man you know face plants into the ground you don't want it to get so cold that you know you just drag on the ground and just kill it you know kill mm -hmm. spider-man you want to have enough art there to continue on and then you want to as you get to the end of the game or you know building up to the end of the game you probably want to have those moments closer together and higher up so you're you're making this swing upwards in elevation kind of thing and you know constantly swinging and then you get up to the top you know to the end of the climax and you you have this huge hot spot like at the beginning of the game but it's probably shorter. It's still just mm -hmm. as hot, but it's probably less length. Yeah, kind like, of thing. Like but going... you never want to let it completely drop all the way down to the bottom because, yeah. and you you would prefer not to get it even close to the bottom because the fact is is everybody every consumer has a different ground level height to where they're going to quit the game mm -hmm. and. And when Spider-Man hits his face on the ground, they're quitting. So the the closer you can make those hot spots, the less likely they're likely, you know, they're going to have Spider-Man face plant on the ground. Mm -hmm. And to go back to what Shark's been saying about in terms of having these wow moments, that once you get into like the back quarter of a game, you know, the wow moments can become far slower. For one thing, you've kind of already introduced all the best stuff, probably in the first quarter to half of your title. But you still need to have something to keep people engaged. Whether it's, as we said, story, a new mechanic, new bosses. And it, this is also... Gorgeous art. 
Mm -hmm. And this is why we see for a lot of games that, again, the longer a game goes, the more of a player drop-off there is. Eventually, it will stabilize. And that's when you're left with your hardcore fans, or the people who are all in at that point. And when you're doing your marketing, what you honestly want to do is you want to market towards, you know, getting as many of those hardcore people on there. And and less away from the others. Now, what I'm not, I'm not saying that you should build your game only for hardcore players. What I'm saying is, is that what you should be doing is aiming to get the people who are going to like your game to play your game, and the people that you know aren't going to like your game, don't market to them, you know? Mm -hmm. Because if, if, if you're making a platformer game, and you're marketing to people who play first-person shooters kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen is those first-person shooter people are going to buy your game. They're going to leave a negative review because this game is shit to them. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to refund it. So now you have a bad review and you have a refund and you made nothing for it. Matter of fact, you may have lost money depending on what platform you're on. So, you know, well, Rastel says some first-person shooters might, players might play platformers. Yeah, but that wouldn't be the first-person shooter audience. That would be the platformer audience because they are in both audiences. But you don't want to market to the first-person shooter market. You want to market to the platformer market. So don't market towards people who aren't going to be interested in your game, market towards people who are going to be interested in your game, because in the end, you will have better reviews, better review scores, and higher sales, less refunds, mm -hmm. because and less wasted money on marketing that really didn't matter, because, like, why spend, you know, let's say $5,000 marketing to um, first-person shooter people when you're gonna spend five thousand dollars marketing to platformer people and make far more money, you you may lose. You probably won't even make five thousand dollars off of the the first person year people. But but yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, but that's still no excuse not to do onboarding because a lot of people will then say, well, why have tutorials? You know, if everyone is playing a first person shooter. Why do we care to have a tutorial section or basic onboarding? Mm -hmm. And that's a fatal mistake because mm -hmm. the reason why is because while you're not marketing, you're, you're marketing for that people, you don't want to limit your market to those people. Mm -hmm. You want to you know, have where anybody who's interested in your game can get into your game and can enjoy your game. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is even if it's not their genre of choice, they were interested enough to put the buy button. So don't lose them after they hit the buy button. Make sure that you have good onboarding so you don't lose them. Make sure that you have a good front-loaded section at the beginning. Make sure you have a good you know, middle that carries you through and a good climax at the end that you know, leaves people on a high note. Because... If people bought the, your game, whether they are your specific target audience or not, if you don't have all those things, they're not going to stay. Yeah. And not only that, but some of your hardcore won't stay because of that either. So mm -hmm. at that point, you're, you're burning a candle from both ends. And we're not trying to make light. We're trying to make darkness in this. Mm -hmm. So you want as least fire as possible. We're, we're, we're burning a house from two ends. You <laughs> want to have an intact house at the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other point is that as a developer, you may not fully know how far your game is going to go. You may think that your game may only appeal to first-person shooter fans, but let's say it's a very amazing like platforming or melee system. You may be able to get fighting game fans in or platformers. And you don't want 
to you'll want to purposely limit your audience. And I think that's kind of the main point. There's a difference between designing a game for a specific market and purposely leaving elements in that are going to limit your market. Yeah. You never want to limit your market. Mm -hmm. Limiting your market is is like putting a knife at your chest and be like, hey, does anybody want to push this in me? You know, because uh I'm I, I got this here. I'm ready to die. Do you want to do you want to do you want to I mean, do you just give this a little push, you know? As a very like like as a very weird example to this, we can even see this with Kaizo games being designed today. There are a lot of Kaizo creators who are putting in quality of life features into their Kaizo games. If a Kaizo game can have quality of life and UX design to it, then your game does not have any excuse. Mm -hmm. A um, few questions. Uh, I want to go back to a question Amir asked earlier, and then we'll get to Rat's Tales question. Um, his question was about how do you know when your gameplay is good? Like, how do you know when you have a, a fantastic core gameplay loop? And that's and, both a very easy question and a mm -hmm. very hard question at the same time. It's a simple extreme answer. Yes. And that is testing. Testing mm -hmm. will tell you what that is. Mm -hmm. Now then, the question is, can you interpret the testing properly? And that's, that's, the, that's the question, you know. Mm -hmm. And can your, are your testers good enough? And do you have enough of them that gets proper testing? And that, that's another factor. And, you know, if you can get good enough and enough proper testers and you're good enough at interpreting feedback and acting upon it kind of thing, and you don't wait too long to get the feedback so that you're not locked into things that you could have changed earlier, as long as you get all those things, you should be on a good path. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe not the 100% optimal path, but you will be on a good path. And, you know, that good path, if, you, if, you're, if you're perfect at all those, you're, you're on the perfect path. Of course, no game is ever perfect, yeah. but, you know, just saying. Yeah, like, it, like, as a good example, that Mage Mountain game that we played on the indie stream last week. It's a deck building roguelike that has some very interesting design systems to it. The art in that game is nowhere, I think, at a state where I would say it's marketable yet. But we were enjoying that game at its, probably one of its more raw states. And again, like with uh, when uh, Neon Continuum was considered a Project Triad, that if people can enjoy your game, you know, as trimmed down without, like, anything else attached to it, that's a good start. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you're done. And again, I think that's where a lot of developers also will tend to struggle. That, hey, you know, me and my ten friends really like my idea. Let's turn into a full-fledged game. No, you still need to do play testing and iteration on top of that. Because, like we've said, once you've gotten your core consumer base down, you've got it dialed in, you need to start looking at ways to be as inviting as possible. And that goes into onboarding and UI UX. Yeah, I really wish I was where you were done because I would have been done with Neon Continuum like uh, yeah. two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it is tough because a lot of these elements that we talk about, they're very much... I don't know if I want to use the term anti-consumer because there's obviously that's when we get into like pay to win and that kind of skeezy stuff. But... Mm. It's kind of anti-gameplay. Like, anything that keeps somebody from enjoying your game, I would say would fit into this category. And Anti-enjoyment. Yeah. To Rat's Tales comment, or question, how do you make a game appeal to a wide audience? Again, a lot of these questions come back to playtesting. It comes back to what the user experience specifically of your game is. There's a reason why people gravitate towards Nintendo and Blizzard when it comes to their gameplay experiences. Because their games are designed to be 
you know, almost immediately gratifying, or at least, you know, a top-of-the-line blizzard, I guess, what we could say. But, like, when we play a game like Battle in Wonderworld, that, when we started playing that, it was just like, you know, eh? Like, this is the gameplay I'm getting? And you don't want somebody to say that 60 seconds into your game. And... I'll tell you from personal experience, see, what happened with my last game, the old word of the day, Chromasia, mm -hmm. the way I attempted to appeal to a wider audience, not a wide, quote-unquote, wide audience, was, you know, it was a tactical RPG, which is definitely a niche. And mm -hmm. um, so I built the game to be the best game I could make for that niche. But at the same time, I did tons of UX design, tons of mm -hmm. UI design, and all this other stuff, and you know, tutorial design, onboarding, all this other stuff, because I know the number one complaint on all tactical RPGs and such is I have never played a game like this before. I have no idea what I'm doing. Refund. Yeah. And, and uh, I was like, I was like, well, Nintendo is making a tactical RPG right now with Mario plus Rabbids. So there's going to be a lot of people who are just entering the tactical RPG thing. And why are they going to just be entering it? Because they did tons of UX and UI design to make the game streamlined, easy to play, easy to learn how to play, and flows smoothly. So mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to do the same thing with mine. Because my aim is um, to be uh, um, like like Nintendo's game, a great game to get new people onto the game, as well as a great game for hardcore people. So I get a far wider audience because I don't eliminate the new people who are interested. Yeah. And and when I did that, I did testing not only with hardcore fans of tactical RPGs because I definitely needed those in there, but I did with moderates and light people as well as people who hate tactical RPGs, as well as people who hate turn-based games in general. And I tested mm -hmm. with all of them, and by the end, they all love the game. And when you can make people who hate your genre and hate your your you know turn based as as a whole when you can make them like your game you're appealing to a wider audience yep and that i think is a very important point that people need to understand that when we talk about kind of the consumer base for genres and particular gameplay loops there's a difference between somebody who is a fan of a particular developer somebody who's a fan of a particular genre or somebody who's just a fan of a very specific game. And a lot of developers fail to capitalize on that. Again, like we've said, when people try to copy, you know, whoever's the popular game, whether it's Darkest Dungeon, FTL, Fortnite, whatever, that just because your game is just like it, doesn't mean you're going to magically get all those people to play your game. And you have to understand, like I said in a post I just wrote a few weeks ago, you have to understand for every genre, what do people like about it? What do people don't like about it? And why do people play this genre? Because if you can't answer those three questions, then you're not going to be able to create or understand what the consumer base expects or what people want to play in it. Yeah, in fact, it's often the opposite of... Mm -hmm. Not only are you you're you're not going to get those people that played the other game to play your game, but you're going to get those people to hate your game mm -hmm. because why would they buy your game if if your game is just an inferior version of this game, yeah. which is why your game either needs to be better or different. And going back to aesthetics, how many games have we played that are retro-inspired that look worse than the Nintendo games they're trying to emulate? Tons, because I, I, I think a lot of those 
are retro inspired because we suck at art and we're not going to invest anything into art. So mm-hmm. here's our best crappy, you know, Nintendo games look like shit. So our games can look like shit too, you know, and we'll put mm-hmm. this out there and it'll sell a lot because Nintendo games look like shit. So, you know, but no, mm-hmm. no, they didn't, you know, some of them did, you know, like the LJ get, LJN games looked like mm-hmm. horrible crap. You know, some of them looked like horrible crap. But the timeless ones, the ones that people aspire to, mm-hmm. do not look like crap. Yep. And 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 using that as an excuse is not going to make your game successful. You know, we see this all the time with all kinds of different art styles. I'll make my game with just basic shapes and that'll make it, you know, stylized. But there's nothing to the basic shapes and mm-hmm. it fails horribly. Where on the other hand you have just shapes and beats that do so much mm-hmm. with those basic shapes and it's amazing. And, and then you have these people that are like, oh I'm gonna do low poly because it's a style and I'll be successful. And it's this generic looking basic crap everywhere. And mm-hmm. and it does, it looks horrible. And nobody nobody cares about those games. Yeah, and... Where at the same time, there's Will Polly that spent the work and effort into mm-hmm. artistry into it. And look really, really great. And people go out and play them. So picking a graphic style is not having aesthetics in your game. Mm-hmm. And without aesthetics, you just have crappy art in your game. And this is, again, that difference of trying to do something above and beyond what these older games did. And there is or no... Or at least do equal to it. Yeah. You have to either be beyond what they did, or you have to go in a completely different direction. If you're just trying to make a Mega Man clone... Like what we saw in Mighty Number no. Nine, you have to do more than that. And if you don't do that, well, again, the question remains: Why should I play your game? Why should I play a worse FTL when I can just play FTL or Darkest Dungeon? And again, complexity is not the answer because complexity a lot is almost the anti-answer because. Complexity is this hurdle that players have to overcome to 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 enjoy your game. Yeah, and that's another really good example as something that's a bad game design element. Complexity does not equal depth. And one of the biggest traps I think a lot of developers fall into is say, hey, wouldn't Darkest Dungeon, hey, wouldn't this popular game be better if we just make it 20 times more complicated? You know, instead of making the control scheme easy to learn, we're going to throw 30 more commands onto this game. Because surely... More sub-menus. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, just keep adding windows, you know. In order to find an answer to your question, you have to go, like, 15 windows deep in order to get that information. Flexity eh. is a train to a point. Mm-hmm. It's not as big as, uh, you know, some of these, but it's, it's definitely a trend that people make overly complex games that have nothing to them, no depth. I have seen some games that are like, you know, just basic platformers, like like less than, than Mario kind of thing, like less than the original Mario. They have less depth, less mechanics, less good stuff than the regular original Mario. Mm-hmm. But they are so complex that it's like, how in the hell do you play this thing? And then they... You know, they they did have some onboarding kind of thing, very loosely. Mm -hmm. And, like, you get to the end and you're like, yeah, this is just the worst Mario one. You know, and and it was so complex and, you know, combobulated and, like, didn't make any sense. And, like, it was was horrible. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. Complexity is not depth. Yep. And What, what complexity is, is... You're you're walking down the street and then you walk into a spider web and you get it all over your face. That is complexity. Mm-hmm. There's a complex spider web that you just walked into and you just uh, got it all over your face and no, get it off me. Mm-hmm. You you what you want to do is you want 
the least complex game that you can make, but mm-hmm. while having all the depth. Because you, the difference between complexity and depth is is complexity is just surface level. It is just this layer where it, it's it's hard to figure out. Yeah. Depth is, man, I can just dive into this and just go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and, and more go to any different kind of direction, kind of thing. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's like a, a, a real kind of uh analogy here would be like um complexity would be a picture a pit a picture a picture of a piece of meat on a table and mm-hmm. you're like wow that is one really good looking piece of meat and then you grab onto it and there's nothing there it's flat yeah. where complexity would be you go get i mean uh, complexity depth would be where you go to get that piece of meat. And man, it, it was created by the most amazing chef ever. Because you you take a bite into it and 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 it's like no other Yes, just cut off for a second. Okay. We're back. Uh, yeah, we're back. That was weird. Yeah. So depth would be in that analogy would be a professionally you know cooked roast kind of thing that when you bite into it it's not just your normal roast you're not just you know like that's a good roast this Mm -hmm. is like you know mind-blowingly good you you got the Mm -hmm. you know maybe lemon and you know hints of lemon hints of you know of uh, garlic hints of uh Mm -hmm. uh you know onion hints of this hints of that and and it it tastes like there's a lot more here and like it it's like just blowing your mind how good this mm-hmm. is kind of thing. Yeah. And you're like, man, I could eat this for the rest of my life and be happy kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Where if you just do normal without complexity or depth kind of thing, then you just have a normal roast. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it, it's good, but it's just, uh, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. a normal roast. Yeah. And a good example of this would be kind of the differences between Factorio and Dyson Sphere Program. That, though, Factorio is a game that has gone to basically define its own genre, you know, that the Factorio-like for a lot of people. And there are a lot of games that have tried to emulate Factorio. And a lot of them you probably have never heard of because they're bad games. They basically said, what if we took all the onboarding and kind of progression of Factorio and made it even more confusing? And those games didn't work. The reason why Dyson Sphere Program kind of blew up was it basically said, here's Factorio, let's make it easier to learn, and if Factorio goes in that direction, we're going over there. And Mm -hmm. it blew up. And I mean, it blew up more than I think the developers even expected it to. And that is that is the kind of success you want out of your game. You want to say, okay, we expect, let's say, 100,000 people to buy this game. And suddenly we are now at 600,000 and counting. And that is that situation where they had what their core audience is. They knew what their audience wanted. But they didn't exclude people who have never touched Factorio before. And when you can... And they also did not do the exact same thing as Factorio. Yep. They were different. So they were both better and different. Oh, yes. In a lot of ways. And when you can do that with your game, where it's not just saying, do I play Factorio or do I play Dyson Sphere? But it's, okay, Factorio does A, B, and C... Dyson Sphere does D, E, and F. So it's different. It's a different variation on the same taste. It also does A and B, too. Mm hmm. But the focus is different in Dyson Sphere than it is on Factorio for, yeah. you know, a very clear reason. They don't want to compete directly with Factorio. Yeah, if you compete directly with a game mm-hmm. by being way too similar to them. Then uh, you're you're in trouble, unless mm-hmm. that game was very very unpopular. Yeah. In which case, 
you still might be in trouble because that game might have been a reason why that game was very unpopular. Yeah. Um, and, and if you if you copy that reason, then uh, you just screwed yourself. Or you get lucky, like Path of Exile, and you know Blizzard dropped so many balls with Diablo three that Path of Exile was just basically like it because you know by default because Diablo three was so poor right out of the gate. And what Ogoro said about obscuring elements that again it's like a variation off of off of complexity that there are a lot of games that are very simple to play but they are so obscured in terms of what it means to play the game that again it falls into that difficulty versus complexity trap a lot of horror games fall into this especially those that are designed around brutal difficulty that you know you take two steps out up oh, enemy runs in stabs you you're dead but you mm -hmm. didn't know that you were supposed to you know whistle in this room and then slowly crawl over here and then the game is easy and this is where we get into those games where the length isn't because the game is good the length is because it's just difficult to learn so that once you know how to play this game it may only be like a 20 minute long run, but it took you like three hours of trial and error to get to that point. Yeah. And that gets into RPGs that have too much grinding kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they will, you know, stretch out the game by having too much grinding in it. And I mean, you do always want, I think, a little bit of grinding in RPGs. Mm -hmm. Because like that's kind of a staple of the genre, but you don't want to overdo it. Now then, there are exceptions to that rule because you can certainly uh, have tons and tons of grinding without overdoing it if you design the game around grinding. And Disgaea did that very exact thing because they designed their game around grinding and made grinding fun through all mm -hmm. the different ways to progress through the game. There's all these different progression loops and those are like, you know, all these, you know, forms a whole lot of different ways to grind, which, you know, is like, sometimes you want to grind more than you actually want to do anything else kind of thing, because the game is built to make that, make that fun, where your normal RPGs are not built to make that fun, you know, mm -hmm. they're, and the more built towards fun that grinding is, the more grinding you can have in your game without being a negative. Mm -hmm. So, and the less the, you, you build towards that, the less you want grinding you want to have into it. So, mm -hmm. you you, you got to have this balancing based off your mechanics and the way your game is set up to how mm -hmm. much grinding you have in it. But oftentimes we see RPGs with nothing built towards grinding and has epic, epic, tons of grinding like to insanity and it's like oh no mm -hmm. and like to Okoro's point about non-guns and rain world like this is that point where we where things kind of go off the rails when it comes to the gameplay you want the player to be able to understand what they're doing if they're just pushing buttons and things are happening that's not getting them invested in the game. That's the issue that I had with Old World. That, yes, my character is moving on the map. I'm seeing numbers go up. Why is anything of this happening? I don't know. So That's also the issue with a lot of adventure games. Mm -hmm. And the adventure genre as a whole. Because, like, a lot of it is, I'm just going to grab these items, and then I'm going to combine these items at random for unknown reasons, and then see try them out here, 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 and try to find one mm -hmm. place where to work. You know, so it's that, yeah. that exact thing. And again, this is where you fail in terms of UI, UX. If somebody's playing your game and doesn't know anything as to what's going on in it, that's not getting them invested. And again, people will argue, well, it worked for me. I figured it out. It only took me, you know, six hours of watching, you know, five YouTube Let's Plays, but now the game is amazing. But again... Yeah, but not all games have six hours worth of Let's Plays on YouTube because uh, mm -hmm. some of them don't have any. Oh, yeah. Uh, with non-guns, like, 
I tried to look up guides for this game on the Steam Guide page, and one of the guides literally said, I don't know what I'm doing in this game, this is just a guess as to how to play it. Mm -hmm. And, again, onboarding UI UX, this is not where you want to, you know, uh, break the mold or make it confusing. It's also not the stone you want to die on. Mm -hmm. Not the hilltop you want to die on, because, uh, why would you die there? I mean, it, yeah, you're you, going to ruin your entire game and all the work you put into it because you refuse to do this one thing. And it's, it's like, it's like, oh, what would be an analogy here? It's like you make a race car and everything. You you spend mil five hundred thousand dollars and like five years of your time to build this elaborate race car, but you're going to put these old bald tires on it because you don't want to put it in. And then the first, you know, time you start it up and put it in the gear, you lose traction, goes right into the wall, and the whole thing blows up. Good job. Mm -hmm. You don't want to die. You, you don't want to kill your, your game or your race car because you didn't put decent tires on it. Yeah. And again, like, if a developer, no developer should be saying, well, the mechanics are supposed to be confusing because that's, you know, part of our vision. No. 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 You, again, this is not where you want to argue with consumers on. If consumers can't figure out your game, that's a problem on you. And I think there's still developers out there who see it as a problem with the consumer. Well, you just don't understand my game or you're not... You're not a fan, or you're not part of our market. No, if somebody... Well, they're, they're partly right. They're, they're not fans of their game, because you didn't... Mm -hmm. you, you know, you didn't take advantage of it. You know, they were willing to become fans of your game. They bought your game. Your game was not willing to let them be fans. You know, and, and you know, it's, it's, like, it's like somebody comes to your door to knock on your door to be your friend and everything, and then you come out, and the first thing you say is, you know what? Screw you, screw you, screw you. And then you punch him in the face. <laughs> yeah, and then it's like, you know, like, yeah, most people are not going to take that, and they're going to leave. And and mm -hmm. is that their fault? No. Is it your fault? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So don't don't try to blame that on them, you know? And I think this is one of the reasons why I've been coming more, even though I'm not a huge fan of them, I've been coming more around to the thought of having different difficulty levels in games. Because if somebody wants to play your game, but they're not the super hardcore, you know, grandmaster at it, give them a lower difficulty level. Again, it should not, at least in better games, should not impact what the other people are doing. But... If you can get, you know, a several thousand more people to play your game by having an easy mode or giving them more approachability options, that's, you know, 2,000 more potential fans for your next game and your next game after that. Because, again, I think this will be my final point and then I think we'll begin to wrap things up. That, <laughs> at the end of the day, bad game design elements they keep people from playing your game they repel them from it and you don't want to be throwing you're essentially throwing money out at that point you know who cares why who cares about people playing my game you know 500 people are happy with it but if you want to succeed in this industry you need to approach things in a way that you're adding people to your fan base, not removing them. And again, there's all again, this is on a genre by genre basis. But again, the games that succeed are the ones that have very wide appeal to it. And the way they get that wide appeal is by understanding why the genre works and also understanding what keeps people from enjoying it and not doing that. You know, if you step on a rake and it hurts your face, maybe you should do something to not step on that rake. Yeah. 
and back to what you said about adding the easy mode, I would personally prefer not to to add an easy mode because, like, I would, you know, I kind of like having one difficulty, so I am only balance the game one time. Mm-hmm. But that the the reason why that I I would not add an easy mode is because not because I would leave things the way they are, but because I would change the way mm-hmm. things are right now. Yep. That they don't need an easy mode. You know, I would address their problems and issues kind of thing in the normal mode Mm -hmm. without changing the difficulty and without having multiple modes. Mm -hmm. And if if their problem is, is that, you know, there's too much of a spike here, I just lower down the spike and make it less spiky kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then people can get through it kind of thing. You know, if if people are having issues with, you know, this one enemy, you know, is very, very random. And sometimes he's easy as crap. And other times he's like impossibly Mm -hmm. hard and there's no chance of winning. I take out that randomability and maybe, you know, say that these moves he can't do anymore. Make a second enemy that can only do those moves, you know. And that, I think, is the best version of that. That one typically that is perfectly balanced and having ways to adjust things within it. But again, mm. a lot of games don't have that option. For instance, a shmup. There are a lot of shmups that you can't fully make that dynamic. There are elements of dynamic difficulty in a lot of shmups and two who style games. But at the end of the day, these games will often say, okay, this is what the level is on easy. This is normal. And then this is insane up here and Mm -hmm. in that case you are trying you can't really combine those markets or you can't combine those audiences into a single dibbly level again like we said it's a genre by genre basis and again that and to end on to be able to do that you have to understand your genre and you have to be able to do all the research that we've spoken about at length over this discussion I think with that, let's wrap things up because, once again, a short topic on a holiday weekend turned into a massive one. So, yep. uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. As always, uh, if you want to catch these shows live, they are done Sunday, starting around 4 4 30 ET. And if you'd like to watch our indie game review show, that in the inquiries, that is Thursdays, starting around 3 3 30 ET on both of our channels. Yep. And make sure to smash the like button and lick the smash button on both of our channels. Uh, links to both of our channels, you know, you're on one, the link to the other is down in the description, as well as a link to both of our discords. And join our discords because there's lots of interesting things that go down there. And I think that will do it. So, as always... Uh, come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where is in the art and science of games, and have a great rest of your 4th of July and holiday weekend. And on board your dang people. See you. <laughs>